Hey, how's it going you guys? This is Peter Hahn. I just wanted to start this video off by saying this is going to be a follow-up to a review I had done earlier on the Euchre's pen, which I introduced in a pen review. This was the base model that I actually purchased online through their company, uh, Euchre's-shop.com. Uh, and um, it's a, I believe, a, um, a company based out in Asia. And they produce basically felt tip pens that can be refilled through a converter or through a cartridge. So it's a reusable felt tip pen that I've been kind of looking for to see how well it would perform. And uh, this is just a follow up to kind of tell you guys the performance of the base model after using it for several number of months. But also a brand new model that they actually sent me over to test out for further uh, kind of feedback and also comparison to the base one that they uh, that actually received and picked up. So in terms of information, uh, about the base model this one was about $19 I believe US uh, not including shipping so for a base model pen this is the cheapest one that they have but of course the benefit of being able to um, refill the ink inside the cartridge or the converter and of course you do have options of different sizes this is a 1.0 uh, they will have different uh, sizes available like a you know 0.8 to 1.2 1.4 and they kind of convert to let's say like a 1.0 would be maybe a in a Stedler or a Faber-Castell, like a Stedler would be like a 0.5, I would say. Faber-Castell felt tip pens, this would probably be in between an F and an M. Regardless, uh, I, I found I, bought, I purchased one, this one mainly due to the fact that I was looking for something renewable because those kind of felt tip pens that I would purchase, you know, through storefronts, I would waste so much plastic over a number of years of actually using them. Uh, so I was looking for some alternative routes in terms of a renewable version, and so this one was quite handy, but. In my uh, video review, I do talk about the fact that it was a little bit um, cheap in terms of the actual materials. Uh, it's very lightweight, which is nice to use. And the overall tip did help hold up pretty well, but I did eventually start to grind it down on a 1.0. After uh, multiple, multiple strokes, months of use, the flow of the ink actually worked really well. Now, I actually even tested out ink that was a bit heavier and more opaque. Uh, not opaque, I'm sorry. Uh, has a bit more mineral in it. So it's a pigment-based ink. And of course, it was recommended that I didn't use that kind of ink, but I did use it. It actually held up just fine. So the flow of the ink and the pen was okay. Uh, it's just that, again, the base materials were so-so. Um, the writing and the flow of it worked out nicely. The end and nib ended up grinding down fairly normally as any felt tip pen would do. Now, of course, due to the use of this, and eventually this is going to grind down to nothing, I will have to eventually replace this end cap. Uh, I think there's a way to even take off the end portion here and possibly even adjust the end nib to get a lot more material, but I have to look into it more deeply. But regardless of it, the pen was fine. Uh, the pricing, I would say, was pretty, uh, pretty good in terms of just having something that you can use for many, many months in a long period of time, especially I was uh, using it for a much heavier period uh, of extensive use and heavy amount of drawing. So some people might use it more lightly, uh, but I was using it a lot more extensively, and which is why you're starting to see a lot more wear. This newer model I haven't um, fully tested out just yet. I did open it. I did place in a converter. Uh, this model is a lot heavier compared to the version that we have right here on the left-hand side. And um, this version in particular was pretty much shipped in a basic plastic bag. But of course, we do have a much nicer packaging for the updated version. The price difference between the two is pretty large. Uh, this one's nineteen dollars. This is actually one of the higher models. This one's called the Metis. Uh, matte black lacquer surfacing and this one has a twist cap screw this one they sent me in a 0.8 size this one costs upwards of $50 US so like I said the cost is not as user-friendly which is why I, I purchased this version at, at the beginning because I find that this one is actually much more approachable to just average daily use if you're really into pens, if you like to collect, if you want something a bit more higher materials, it has a bit more weight to it, uh, you're, you know, again, this is actually so far feeling pretty good in the hand. Uh, it has a nice texture to it. Uh, the weight, again, is significantly much more than this one, which some people like, some people may not. But overall, based on even putting the cap on it, a lot of the weight right now is going to the back end, uh, somewhere towards the middle, but definitely more back end heavy. If I take it off, it's a bit more centered, I would say, but it's still a little bit leans to the back end side. So what that means is as you draw, you'll have a little bit more weight placed on top uh, of the pen itself. So it actually will rotate and move fairly nicely. Uh, but for those of you that don't like heavier pens, this will put a bit more pressure on your fingers and eventually can also create a little bit of strain. So be mindful of weight of the pens. 
but it does feel much much more luxury because of the price point and the material changes up close detail shots i'll do some b-rolls for this stuff but so far uh, again the actual build construction uh length the width slight differences um you can see the difference in design to the clip to the actual design where this is also just a pull cap uh this one's a twist type and even the actual base uh, is a different design but i do believe the actual end nibs are the same this one i believe yeah you can actually twist off the uh, top end and it will eventually pop out so uh, that should give us a little bit more potential customization where i can actually even move the nib uh, further out to get a lot more material if it does start to grind down the back end doesn't unscrew this one will have then the converter on the inside as I was kind of playing with it, I did notice the base of this being plastic, uh, where a lot of this is it's a little bit harder construction, possibly just ABS. Uh, but the baseline right here is a much more of a, of a kind of a cheaper plastic. So there's a little bit of a hitch right there based on manufacturing. So when you actually close the cap of it, it's a little bit finicky, but it works just fine overall. Um, and again, it just feels nicer. It looks nicer, even though most people might not be able to see a discern difference. But for me, after using numerous, numerous pens, I do very much more fond uh, of this design, especially even the way the back end cap is designed. It holds it much more securely. Uh, this one, as you hold to the back end, does kind of have a finicky feel to it. It twists off very easily, so it doesn't really hold it securely. So I like having a bit of extra material to the back end cap so it rests on my hand. So um, overall, though, I did have a positive response to this pen it did eventually you can start to see a lot of grinding like the surface of it starts to scuff away the, uh, the, the um, actual pen clip is also quite scratched and scuffed so I used it quite a bit it was my pretty much everyday go-to pen um, and I'm looking forward to using this one with a lot more uh, extensive use so let's play with that just real quickly I'm also going to do is a drawing demo and this video is also going to be a slight um, promotion to a new book that will be coming out very shortly uh, and I'll be using excerpts and notebooks uh, note drawings that I have from my originals uh, of the new book I'll be producing which is called the dynamic bible which is a collection of lecture notes from the class that I instruct called the dynamic sketching class so these are the actual lectures and notes that I would have pertaining to a singular subject which goes into insect forms so this kind of gives you an idea of, uh, of construction and how to build and break down forms and we use multiple different subjects of everyday world stuff around us from animals to organic things to mechanical structures and seeing patterns and rhythms in everyday things then knowing how to observe it properly effectively and also efficiently to draw anything with without hesitation and build a very strong visual memory and so that way as you move into potentially things like imagination sketching design uh, whatever application of the creative outlet this kind of visual well of information can back up a deeper sense of construction and understanding how to build things in general. Uh, so whatever you may not have observed or seen, you will be able to approach it with the same relative confidence. And it is a confidence boosting class because again, we're strictly using pen and ink uh, to do these sketches. So these are the originals that have been scanned and we placed inside the book. The book itself will be announced very shortly. You'll, uh, I'm sure I'll post more information about it you can definitely follow me more on Peter Han style at Instagram which I'll post a lot of my information but these are gonna be off to the side and um, I'll be using these as a way to kind of like talk about how I approach that specific subject of insects and I do also have a little model here that I can use and this is a dead insect uh, part of a collection that I have in my boxes and this one in particular is a longhorn uh, beetle and we'll be using this one as a model to draw from observation. And the observational drawing is crucial and important because I can start to see a lot more uh, nuances of the details. I can start to get a sense of its surfacing texture. Um, I pin this down to the box a bit better. But again, I can see a little bit closer to the details. I can get certain angles and shots that I would not be able to find in a photograph potentially. So we'll leave this off to the side here for the moment. Um, we'll find an page over here in the sketchbook and the sketchbook that I am using currently right now is actually more of a toothier kind of a rag paper that was custom built and uh, I got this at the store called Goldbug and this is based in Pasadena but they do have an online store look up Goldbug store or in Pasadena uh, online Google you should be able to find it so I will be using the Metis uh, the Euchre's pen and we'll just see how it feels in terms of weight movement uh, it does have ink in it fresh the ink that I am currently using is a pigment based ink and it's the uh, platinum carbon ink right now. Again, that's a pigment base, which is more water resistant. So I like using water resistance inks because if I use watercolors or markers, it won't bleed it and run it. So 
Again, it was always recommended that I didn't use those kinds of inks, but so far testing it within the base model, I actually found that it actually worked just fine. It didn't coagulate, didn't block it up. So I'm confident uh, knowing the fact that they're using the same in, uh, inner me mechanism in the base of the construction of the felt tip, that it probably won't ruin it anyway. Um, so like I said, just when you do test kind of inks and stuff like that, it is recommended you guys use water-based inks. So if you do attend to go with the pigment base, that is more based on my experience. So fair warning, it's uh, if you test it and it does ruin it, just keep in mind the fact that it is more recommended that you use water-based inks and you are risking your pen if you use a pigment based. Uh, I found that to be successful, but be mindful of the kind of inks that you're using. So the first thing I want to do is just kind of place down some shapes and forms. I'm going to tilt this in a certain angle of view that I want to capture from. And uh, let's actually position that a little bit better. Okay. So as I kind of find angles that I want to go for, turn this down a little bit harder. Looking for shots, looking for angles. Typically going for the approach in dynamic sketching, we want to understand proportion first. So I might want to even just do a side view initially, kind of tilting it to the angle of view. I'm looking straight on at it. So we're going to start with a side view, which is a focus towards proportion. Now I'll use basic lines and shapes to you know, essentially uh, simplify this as basically as I can. I'm going to adjust the camera to zoom in a little bit more, and so that way we can kind of see some of the drawings with a bit more clarity. Now you may not be able to see the actual insect in place. I might try to place it somewhere on the video on the screen, uh, but for now we'll just kind of go off of what I can see. And the first thing I want to do is establish a sense of proportion of length. So I have the length of the animal. I'll start to break down the biological anatomy of the animal itself. With insects, I'm also looking for some sort of pattern. Uh, much like when you're drawing the human figure, uh, you can find you know human patterns within things like symmetry to the proportional breakdown of measurements from torso to things like the leg features, uh, looking for landmarks, and just overall getting a better sense of proportion through practice and repetition, but using things like inner lines, central lines, and wrapping three-dimensional forms or two-dimensional shapes around it in a certain flat view to uh, better get an accuracy of that model. So here, the same thing with this animal. I am looking for shapes at the moment. Shapes being two-dimensional, I'm just kind of flattening out the cutout of this. And I'm using things like flattened uh, boxes or geometric structures of shapes. Again, I'm not really considering this as three-dimensional. I'm going more for two-dimensional right now. And as I kind of build out the structure, I have the sense of a one, two, three, and these are the major components of the insect. As you can see over here, we have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And we have a hard carapace shell, the exoskeleton of the animal itself. We do have the antennas obviously stemming off from the head, three legs as per insects. We can find within the side view that the front pair of legs are attached to the thorax, the back pair of legs are attached somewhere near the abdomen, um, and further back legs are way attached to the abdomen. So I can find lines and, and indicate things like where the antennas are going into. Uh, I can indicate areas of where joints of legs are attached as well. So right now, I'm not really considering quality of the drawing itself in terms of aesthetic. I'm trying to understand uh, more about the proportion and the construction of this animal. So I'm not overly concerned about the aesthetic view of this thing. So for a lot of people that are warming up, uh, I understand that drawing and sketching can have a bit of a burden because you're afraid of producing a bad drawing. Now, bad drawings, in my personal opinion, is more based on having not a clear intention of what you're trying to do. So as you go in there and sketching and you're trying to maybe uh, figure something out, but if you're giving yourself this expectation that it has to look really good, that is not lining up with what your intention is supposed to be. If you're trying to understand, you want to study. So the use of study, you want to try to simplify this as much as possible. And so that way you can start to build a stronger memory towards it. So here, again, I am not concerned about the way it looks, but I am concerned about things like accuracy of proportion, the kind of shapes and lines that I want to use. Uh, a method of draw through so that I can layer more information on top. Here are the different leg parts as it goes back. The antennas themselves have a certain shape and also a rhythm of pattern of forms, not forms, but uh, structures of the antenna. I can see that the eye section is right there, but this is all I really need to just to get a sense of the spacing in between sections measure out that general proportion. So I've done a side view. That's simple enough. 
Now turn the angle of view and start to kind of analyze it from a different shot. And which are a little bit larger, it is best to always use some sort of thumbnail. And this is where you can just kind of sketch something out to just feel it. Just to get a sense of what's going on. And you don't have to, again, consider line quality. But we're able to just go in there with a, with a smaller iteration. We can now, much like the side view, mark off these anatomical sections of the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, the one, two, and three. So even in a slightly different angle of view, the approach and the mindset is very similar. And from this now, I have to make decisions as to what kind of forms, three-dimensional forms, that I want to use that indicates these areas of anatomy. So again, the thorax section, back into the abdomen, the top care for shell, to the bottom section over here. I'll use the lines that cross over, the cross contour line that describes the wire frame in the three dimensions of that structure itself. The planes obviously do that as well too, but the further communication of three dimensions is always uh, a useful thing. The antennas are going to be described with a line, a gesture, the movement. I can find the placement of where the legs are attached, and I'm able to now draw lines that indicate the length of the legs and the posing and the positions of them. I can also connect those lines together that essentially uh, lines up to project a line towards the horizon line because as a three-quarter angle view these lines can also recede backwards to a space on the horizon line to a vanishing point now again this animal in particular is not necessarily sitting on the ground plane it's floating because of the needle uh, so if the animal was touching the ground you could even foot, find foot placement which gives you even a stronger sense of the ground plane and perspective here, as we're floating, I'm using the in-between sections of joints to interconnect together. Here's a leg coming up, connected over there, leg down. Same deal as the leg comes down, back section. Using primitive three-dimensional forms, things like cylinders, cross contour, I can now build out a sense of some of the elements of details and also features, things like the limbs and also the feet. But I'm not going to go into the smaller micro uh, details of this thing just yet. I am not rendering it. I'm not in consideration of hatching due to uh, I, the fact that I don't want to consider light and shadow just yet. I'm trying to go for the sense of proportion and shape and form. So once I get that, my intention is very clear. And so that means I also know when to stop. That means the completion of this drawing is with the intention of describing to the viewer uh, what this thing and how it's constructed, what it's built of within the forms and shapes that I decide, and communicating its accuracy of its anatomy through a form. So we have now this three-quarter angle view, quick small little thumbnail to try to, uh, trying to figure things out, essentially carrying over the information from the side view to the three-quarter shot. As I go down to the angle over here uh, on the bottom plan, um, bottom side of the paper, I'll do a little bit of a larger sketch. And again, same thing, I might just reposition and move the insect a little bit, just trying to find another angle. Uh, I can repeat the one that we had beforehand because again, we've studied it. We know what it kind of looks like and feels like. So repeating that study again will give you a lot more accuracy, control to line, and also being able to become more familiar to the layers and also then the repetition that uh, basically strengthens and, and locks in uh, that experience. So here, same thing. Drawing from that same angle, knowing what I have at the moment, let's kind of place in our central line again. This line represents, again, the body from the head to the end of the abdomen. I don't know exactly how long the animal is, but by doing the study, I have a general feel. I want to go in and lock in things like head, thorax section, where the abdomen then goes to the back end area over there. This helps me also dictate the size of the scale of the drawing, position of where it goes as well, too, on the paper itself. I can now start to visualize and project where things are going to go on the paper. If I'm either going to go off the page or if I have enough space and overlapping things, I'm able to predict that preemptively. So here, same thing, I'm going to build now the shapes of the head, but this time I'm going to be just a little bit lighter about it, knowing the fact that I'm going to detail this a little bit more. Right now I'm leaving the pen off to the side further so that as I scratch into the paper lightly, the strokes and the lines are becoming a lot thinner. So far, this Euchre's pen is responding well. It has a nice light touch. As I alter the angles in which I hold it in, it seems to respond with every single stroke. It doesn't seem to skip way too dramatically, which is a good thing. Not finicky. 
and it has a very light graze to it. This 0.8 size is probably about a, equivalent to a Stedler 0.3, uh, even maybe a little bit thinner than that, slightly. But the Fabric Castells, this definitely feels like an S size pen. So they kind of have their own custom sizing, it seems like, but uh, I would say that's the equivalent so far. Let's get down to the thorax section. Fill that that form. Again, I've marked out these areas as to where the length of these body parts fit. Here's the bottom section of where the leg attaches. I'm gonna go to the back end abdomen with the carapace shell. As it builds backwards overall shape, I can see that the original marker is a little bit short. So I'm gonna lengthen it just slightly, adjusting proportion. This area of drawing through is an important part of construction to maintain accuracy. So don't worry about layering stuff. Keep things as um, focused in terms of the areas of things that you're trying to accomplish. Don't focus on the details at the very beginning just yet. Here's another leg attachment. Underside of the abdomen. Hanging out right there. You can see the attachment to the back leg really near the, the antennas. Kind of more in that section there. So now as I start to build, again, the front pair of legs out. An ending marker in relation to where the head is, that distance, I'm seeing the end of the actual limb of the joint, and I can line that up. Bit of force shortening coming in there. Leg comes forward. The other leg is sticking out from this end. As I take this joint to that joint, if I kind of line them up, I'm trying to find out where the ending position is. The leg continues forward. The foot placement. Let's go to the other leg coming up and over it overlaps and crosses the antenna based on my view here's the back end leg as it backwards here into the plane again these points you could potentially visualize a connection if you like to especially if the animal that you're drawing from is standing on the ground so now that i have generally everything in place much like i had before a little bit lighter a bit more gestural movement not being super um, enforced with the weight of the pen. So I just wanna make sure I gradually build this now. Let's go back into some of the details and refine them into the eye. This is where now I'm being more control of the pen pressure. I'm gonna go back to the front. And now go around the shape. Finding the attachment of the antenna there. Now it's a put a bit more weight onto the pen again it is responding nicely the line is going a bit heavier but i can easily tell with also like every other felt tip pen with extensive use this felt tip nib will eventually grind away so yeah uh it's not a everlasting pen like a fountain pen with a metal tip which you are able to continue to use lifetime wise uh, as long as you take care of it you know use good ink re relatively clean it uh with you know um often use but with these felt tip pens eventually you will have to re replace them by this part uh, so far you know it's been um, pretty good in terms of the weight I'm not necessarily feeling any kind of strain in my fingers just yet uh, so I'm being mindful of like my hand placement there are these threads right there so I want to be careful not pressing on that I don't want to hold the pen too close to the nib also because I don't want to control it too tightly I tend to hold my pen more to the distance of the midpoint so these threads, if they were possibly, I don't know, maybe moved more, I don't know how you would problem solve that, possibly maybe the adjustment of the placement, um, but I think holding it slightly behind it is okay for me, but I kind of want to hold it somewhere right in the middle of where the threads are. Uh, as I noticed with some of the other pens that don't have the threads, I think if there wasn't even an option of pen designs, of the caps being optional of, you know, being screw types and also just a, a kind of a, a standard cap. It would be nice to have that option a little bit. I'm not against the screw cap because obviously a lot of the fountain pens I do use are also very much that way. Uh, I'm just kind of speaking my mind as I use it and think about stuff. So far, again, it's not bothering me too much, but I kind of feel like uh, I'll pay attention to things as I go. Um, so let's start to go to the bottom side of the insect now. Attach the limbs. We'll wrap that line weight just a bit heavier so we can really clearly define the structures. We see some mandible sections here, mouth parts. Here's a front pair of limbs as they come forward. Cross contour around those structures. 
Here's the other leg, cross contour, finishing out that silhouette. The front pair of the feet, I can see the scaling rhythm that goes to the hooks of the ends. Same thing over on this side, they're almost like little triangles, finding a shape to represent those pieces. And of course, the little end hooks. Go to the midsection, I kind of wanted to establish these antennas first, so that as I layer things, uh, this will sit on top, on top of the legs. As I use things like line weight, and also next steps into going things like the hatching, that draw through will not become as uh, distracting. Let it go to the back end of the antenna, thinning out these lines. Let's go to the next pair of legs, layer. Thinking of lines that curve, lines that straighten, finding structure, and also the idea that we're interpreting this animal. I'm not necessarily copying what I'm seeing. I'm analyzing the parts and the pieces of that anatomy, and I'm interpreting how I would draw it with the structural form. So whether I'm using something of a simplistic primitive shape like a, a form like a cylinder box, but now that I have those, uh, with a line on top, I also really want to consider the way the lines move, whether they have a curvature to them or a straightness to it. The contrast of straight and curves are also very nice. It's a, it's a method that we use quite a bit in figure drawing, but even in this method, we can also incorporate that. This balance of structure, then gestural movement of line. It gives you a bit of energy. Go to the underside of the abdomen a bit more. So now that I have this placement, you start to see multiple studies in succession uh, that kind of gives you now an, uh, a bigger picture. And um, this idea that the mindset is clearly more focused on not necessarily trying to finish out each and every single drawing, but it's a combination of a package of ideas that communicates more information of clarity. Go to the back pair of legs here. So what this should hopefully do is also enable you to let go of this sense of expectation in your singular studies. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you're not allowed to spend the time to increase the level of aesthetic uh, surfacing details, hatching methods to increase more sense of volume, uh, capturing light and shadows. Those are all very good things. But right now in the class that I teach, it's also about this idea of being able to observe the world around you and draw things in a very effective, uh, timely manner because a lot of the methods that we incorporate in the class is also applied to on-site drawing. So through observational drawing, some of the things that you actually see, you may not have all the time in the world to sit there and build it. You got to be able to capture it very efficiently, as I have mentioned, um, and so that way you're not sitting there being frustrated trying to actually analyze the things around you uh, and being able to sketch it with a very good sense of confidence. So this method really helps that helps that view of the world of what you'll analyze more of is less on what's happening on the surfacing, but more to the idea of how to build it from the interior out, and that can apply to animals, to bone structure, to vehicles, props, even um, human forms as well. So I'll use this method drawing people at like cafes uh, and, and people ask me, it's like, well, how do you incorporate that when you are observing people or animals that are constantly moving? Uh, well, you're able to hopefully uh, build a stronger visual memory of the parts and the pieces of individual subjects. And so even though they are fidgeting, moving around, as you have a general pose in place, you're able to lock it in with a couple of lines and forms. So as they move, you can continue to apply some of the volume of the structures and the details of what the person is wearing as they continue to adjust uh, without really stopping or adjusting and even starting over. Now that I have a general build of structure in place, uh, let's even like place in a general grid line on the bottom plane, basic perspective and area right there. Now let's go back to the beginning. Uh, this is going to be an area of focus, a circular area right there. That's going to be an area of focus. And so I'm going to pick out some sections. And because the animal is relatively dark value overall, uh, I'm going to still kind of push and look for things like bounce lights, uh, look for things like reflections, uh, look for things like pattern changes. I'm going to go in there and make decisions based on which direction to hatch into. Now I'm going to incorporate other pens here as well too. I'm going to bring in the other Eucharist pen as well because this one is a little bit of a thicker um, nib which is going to be useful here to build line weight. So let's build a general direction of hatching and I'm going to follow in the direction of the way the form turns, the three dimensions of it. And I've established those here with the cross contour lines. Those lines right there are the grids in which we can follow the hatching. There is a little light pattern on that side. And I don't also want to be afraid to just push the value darker in some of these areas and even losing some of the details. And that's okay. So grouping your values. 
all these areas are not in bright highlights, but there are obviously value changes that continue to strengthen matching. I can also then push line weight around it, it just continues to reinforce. I want to move my hatching in another direction right there. And I continue to move around the head. I don't want to get, get, get stuck in one spot. I want to continue to move hatching around the head again. Because of the fact that there is no heavy amount of uh, extreme texture on the surface, it is more smooth care for shell. I'm going to move my hatching in this uniform direction that follows with the grid lines of the cross contour. Here is the antenna. Pushing my line weight on the interior just a bit more. Call out that section a bit further. On the eyes, again, same thing. I'm going to bring in a bit of hatching that moves around the compound eye. Hatching in that uniform direction. In between these areas, you'll find even things like patterns. There's a light strip of pattern below here, which you can analyze in the insect on the other side. Same thing, I'm going to go back and hatch in the movement of these forms, which have been dictated by lines preemptively. On the back side here, I can't really see some of those details, so what I'm going to do is use my ink and just block it out. As I continue to hatch with the movement of the form, these are all short directions of hatching to control the line. I'm going to keep that focus in the area of that I circled. As I move outside the focal point, the areas that I want to control, I want to show this spot specifically is where I'll maintain a lot of details and hatching, surfacing, everything outside of that I won't really touch as much. This is not because you're not allowed to over-render things, but it's more of a sense of time management, but also being able to communicate just enough information, and so that way whatever you show to the viewer, it's enough for them to fill in the gaps for you, and so that way it enables you to move more effectively. And also, in terms of the idea for me about the mastering of the draftsmanship is about what you don't draw, making proper decisions of where you reinforce your time and parts that you know that you can communicate through the use of indication. The indication factor, of course, is about suggesting certain elements and features or details, and it's enough information to communicate, and so that way whoever you're trying to sell this information to can understand what you're trying to say. And here's that light pattern underneath. A plane of the actual thorax is darkened up as well too push that dark down uh, in this area again same thing i can see this kind of cast shadow emerging from the antenna i'm going to continue to move around this structure uh, as i have then a pattern also emerging as well like piece on this side same thing grouped together now i'm doing this first layer of hatching uh, generally to do a coverage i'm going to bring in the heavier pen to reinforce some darker spots and also to kind of change up the line weight within the hatching itself. So I can blend some areas to kind of push things a bit darker. As it gets to the close edge of the focal point, I'm not going to touch it as much. Notice again, I'm going to move around the cross contour in one uniform fashion. I don't want to mix up a bunch of different directions uh, due to, again, the loss of clarity. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not allowed to experiment with directions of hatching and movement. You're welcome to. For instance, right there, I moved a different direction that represents a shadow from this leg. Uh, but again, you, you can play with it and find your own aesthetics. These are things that are more of suggestions based on opinion through trial and error, based on my many, many years of drawing, 20 plus years in this method of technique. Um, but and like any of the rules, things can always be bent, questioned, uh, customized, edited, and as you make decisions, take a bit more of a sense of um, not really ownership, but um, this moment of aha where you have an understanding of how to really use it as a tool. So once you get that moment, this strength of confidence now continues to upbuild and uh, any, anything else that comes towards you using this particular type of style, or not style, but method and thinking, uh, you will have that, again, sheer level of confidence to approach it with that understanding of what to go for, no matter what it is. And what we're looking for, again, like I said, is that this kind of construction of the animal itself can be then applied to a different insect which we'll show another one real quickly here in a second. Uh, let's go to the back leg over here. I, I kind of moved to the back end section. I kind of felt that out, but I want to move back to the front end and just kind of finish off these portions. And you know what? Let's move over to the other pen now. Let's close up this current Euchre's pen, which has been working pretty well so far. Put on the side. Here's the Euchre's, which has a point, 1.0 nib. So with this one, I'm going to actually move ink a little bit heavier. Hop. 
as it gets to the foreground. It's not as uh, dense of a line. It's a definitely enough for me to make a difference. Right now, pressure-wise, I'm trying to be mindful and not press too hard. But I am gripping relatively tightly, but not to the point of strain. Movement mostly is coming from my wrist to my finger area. The arm is kind of locked in place. And my wrist is my contact point where it's always on the paper sliding along. So this is information uh, based on series of lectures that I teach under my own platform of, of classes again called Dynamic Sketching, which was passed down to me from my mentor who taught it for a many number of years at the Art Center. And um, I learned it from him back when I was a student uh, in from 2002 to about 2004, um, having been mentored by him, but also uh, working with him, TAing for him in the class, learning to explain the processes, but then eventually even getting approval to take this outside of Art Center and teaching it within other schools. Around 2010 is when that kind of happened. Um, but this course, again, is a, a fundamental building block as much as like things like perspective, uh, figurative work, uh, still life drawing, other forms of fundamental drawing is, is a crucial aspect. And for this one, again, it's primarily about building that sense of confidence to draw things in observation. We can build a much stronger visual well and memory, uh, a language, a visual library of all those things that you can use for further application in design or storytelling, as I mentioned. As a reminder, I've gotten some heavier lines in place. I'm going to go back on top of the hatching and just kind of reestablish some darker lines in between some sections just to kind of push that out a little bit heavier and blend them. Maybe you're just kind of grouping some of these things together. I don't want to overcomplicate some parts, and some things can just be just grouped. I have a general feel. It looks pretty good. I'm going to go back to the other pen, the Metis. Getting that thinner line, looking at the actual uh, reference again from observation, putting it down just a little bit more. And as I look at the back end of this top shell, I can start to see some spots of patterns emerge. And I start to indicate, show that they are there. This focal point area is not supposed to be strict. It is there as a suggestion of where to centralize information. So I can always move outside the focal point if I need to. Continues out. There's some base cross contours for those lines of the legs. Let's push a bit more line weight around some of the areas. What I also want to do at this point is even establish things like where cast shadows are underneath the animal. So just as a general shape, of placement, I can see like the leg structure coming up this way over here. I can see another leg coming out that way, connected over here. Here's a thorax section, and this is just a general kind of information about uh, the understanding of the light direction. The the antennas moving out this, way. and I can then use a very simple one directional hatch, place in the ground. Typically moving in a cross perpendicular to the center line on the ground plane here. And just filling up the cast shadow. As it gets outside the focal point, same kind of deal. I'm going to just do it a little bit less, space them out, grade, uh, gradate them a little bit more, which gives you a sense of its, great, um, of its depth and also transition as it goes back. Back and put to the legs. Pass shadow down over here, just establishing those shadows again. So as we're starting to come to the conclusion of this drawing, uh, first couple of notes, I would say that this Euchre's pen is working fairly well. I do enjoy using it so far. The weight of it actually does feel nicer to me. I like heavier pens in general. Um, I am actually not a big fan of super light pens. Uh, I actually do find that I grip it much harder on lighter pens for some reason. I think it's because I do feel like it's kind of like uh, so quick in movement. I want to try to control it more, so I tend to tighten up quite a bit. With heavier pens, I actually am, am a little bit looser. That's what I find. That's, that's me personally, though. Other people may not necessarily like the weight of this thing, uh, but this Metis um, is strictly, I would say, more for people that are more like collectors. People that do like luxury-based pens, 
um, if you're you know more extensively into the world of sketching and drawing uh, every single day this is a solid pen to draw with but like I said in terms of performance you're not gonna get that much difference compared to this $19 one from Euchre's compared to this $50 one from Euchre's and a lot of it has to do with the fact that the actual end nib is of the same construction so really what you're getting is just a higher material um, which is you know definitely noticeable but that's because you know um, because of this nib part you're not really gonna get that much variation between one to the other so for those of you that are looking for an everyday use pen but don't want to break the bank I would still recommend the $19 one. For those of you that are really into the pen culture and like collecting them, just want something with, with a bit more statement uh, and also just maybe even the way it feels, this one does feel a lot better to me. So it does have a couple of pluses on that side, which is not just the visual look, uh, the better materials, the weight of it. Uh, it just feels better in movement. I can actually feel the response to the paper. With a light one, it just kind of uh, shakes quite a bit because of the lightness as I hit this kind of textural paper it will kind of skip on it slightly uh, it'll catch edges of the paper and you'll feel it within the pen overall those small things make a big difference to me because as I have certain movements if it's not a smooth transition and it skips and it shakes a little bit it creates little odd jitters which you know I may not necessarily want unless I'm intending to do so uh, but those small things for most common you know just regular people who are just uh, note-taking casual sketching are not really going to take pay too much mind to that but if you're very serious about your sketching if you're um you know like i said invested in your professional uh, career in art and design and you're producing and you're using this for more of a professional manner uh then i think it can show a, a slight change in performance due to the way it responds to you uh, but like i said everything i just kind of stated was more based on my own personal kind of experiences of things with this pen so far from just this first like one quick 20 minute drawing uh, but having that short amount of time invested into it I can already understand and read how I would use this and how I would respond to it with months of use so I can already tell uh, if I continue using this one as I, ha I will uh, I'm probably going to continue to favor it as I am now uh, so at the moment I would say your best form of judgment is more based on then you know what your background is what you're using it for is it casual is it professional are you interested in the pen field and culture of that side then you can make a proper decision so this is not necessarily to tell you if it's a good pen or a bad pen this is more based on uh, as you know someone who just draws every single day uh, just a follow-up to how this pen responded and felt to how this new iteration and model uh, is now in hand um, so beyond that this sketch now is kind of in place as a study. This is the Longhorn Beetle. As we have the Longhorn Beetle established. This is with the Euchre's pen. Metis model. matte lacquer version as well too is what we're going for as we've seen with the studies we go for the proportion studies of different angles of views trying to extend that in repetition to increase more information and details by getting a larger scale of the drawing finding the area of focus intensifying that render in that area using hatching that moves with the form with the cross contour and everything was done with the felt tip pen so I hope you guys found this video interesting and uh, also helpful in any suggestion towards advice in sketching in general uh, with ink and this particular pen the Euchre's Metis is one I wanted to test out and I actually did like it quite a bit uh, I will be carrying this as a daily and of course the dynamic Bible the book I produced that has these kind of notes inside of it will be announced very shortly so keep an eye out on that on my Instagram channel uh, feed which you'll find that Peter Hans style and of course I'll mention more things on my YouTube channel here as well too so thank you guys for your time and dropping in and checking out the video if you have any more uh, suggestions or things you'd like to see based on pen reviews uh, drawing uh, studies educational stuff possibly as well too you can always also watch my twitch uh, stream which has uh, every bi-weekly kind of live streams that talks about you know Q&A for advice and drawing uh, approach towards a career in the industry and so whenever you catch one of those of course do interact as much as you can so in any case till next time thank you guys and I appreciate it have a good one